Mr. Taylor Dry. You ready for this, man? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, right, let's hang out. Let's drink some tea. Let's chat. Drink some tea, man. Tales in the Cock Podcast, episode two. We honored? This is the second one? Second one ever, oh, man. Oh, wow. Second one ever. First That's beautiful. Me and, uh, me and Andrew on the couch. Oh, cool. Drinking some nice tea. Beautiful. Today we're here in, um, what's this place called? The Mad Monk Tea Shop. Beautiful Ocean Beach, San Diego. Um, I, I really wanted you to be on this episode, man, because you've been pretty instrumental in a lot of the weird decisions I've made the past couple of years. <laughs> I don't know if I should be <laughs> credit for that or not. <laughs> Even like, do you remember that I came up with the name to call my stuff m- of macaque? Like pictures of macaque was my blog. Tales of Macaque is the podcast. Yeah. I think it's the name of my book, but I, I keep going back and forth on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, the name Macaque came out of us drinking tea and you telling stories about being in Taiwan. You used to go there for business a lot. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you always went there for business until I moved there. Yeah. <laughs> That's so <laughs> true. You decided not to visit. I'll be back there this uh, this spring, though, so well, I won't not that there. it matters. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be there. But I remember so clearly you telling us about uh, all the wildlife and all your adventures there. Oh, yeah. The and then you just subtly dropped in the conversation that the, the national monkey of Taiwan is a Formosan rock macaque. Yeah, the rock macaques. It was like <laughs> the, the record on the conversation just screeched. Like, hold up, hold up. <laughs> Called macaque. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah, if you're playing with a monkey in Taiwan, technically you're playing with macaque. <laughs> <Yeah>, always. <laughs> Which is, I just thought that was so funny, man. Yeah. We went there for like an hour, just like drinking tea with macaque. Did you ever see any in, when you were out there? Did yeah, you get, yeah, get yeah. out to the central part or the mountains? Yeah, I saw some in Taroko. Where's Taroko? Taroko's on the east coast down by Hualien. Okay. It was, um, that was one of the first places I went, man. I went there because I went and stayed with, uh, what's our buddy, Joe Wexler? Yeah. Stayed with him in Luo Dong, which uh-huh. is like to the east of Taipei. Yeah. And then I just got sent down at the request of uh, one of Andy Taylor's friends. Huh. She said like, yeah, you can stay with me or you can go to Taroko, which I, I, I don't know because like Taiwanese are so welcoming. Yeah. I thought she was like not wanting me to stay with her. She said, <laughs> should I go to Taroko? But I didn't know what it was before I got there. I yeah. I didn't realize that it's like a huge national park. Yeah. I've, this is the first time even hearing of it. So okay. first to show. But I got there, and I'm pretty sure that's where they filmed Warriors of the Rainbow. Huh. You know that movie? Yeah, it's a gorgeous film. Yeah. It's, most it's epic also movie. a terrifying film. A terrifying movie. Yeah. For folks who don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a yeah. great movie about the aboriginals fighting Japanese. A lot of blood and decapitations <laughs> and <laughs> decapitation. ferocity. It's so ferocious. <laughs> A little bit of judo. Yeah. There's, there's some cool. aboriginals who uh, side with the Japanese and just train judo. That's true. <laughs> yeah, it gives you some wild perspective on you know, kind of the Hakka people and what they went through while the Japanese were on their way. It's a really intense film. It's like, it's so funny. We always think of like those big, you know, productions, those big monster war pieces as being like American. And then you you see like a a cool Chinese one or a Taiwanese one and they do it. And sometimes it's like better, you Mm -hmm. know, it's like, it's really cool. It gives you that fresh new perspective. Yeah. I like, what I liked about that film was, you know, it didn't play one side. It just showed the mess that was that time period. Right. And um, I like that kind of objective observation. Yeah, you can't really say there's a good guy in the movie. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. good guy is not the right word. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, you know, that's interesting. I've been watching um, with a small group of friends this show called Hell on Wheels, and it's about how, you know, that we won the West mm-hmm. by taking the, you know, the train, like the I can't remember what it's called, like the National Pacific Railway or something like that. And uh, there's just utter lawlessness. And the hero is not a, you know, he's not your quintessential hero type who's just mm. like stands by his morals, you know, he's like a ruthless killer. And it's just, it's very kind of, I don't know, it's ultimately kind of Chinese, you know, there's a little bit of Dallas. Like, mm. they're not going to say what's right or what's wrong. This is just kind of what's going on. And it's really gripping. And it has some of that. As well, it's like it's a really cool series. Have you seen Hell on Wheels or no? I, I've been behind on every series. Yeah. Well, you've been traveling a lot, man. That's like a good yeah. excuse. I, I joke that that's the reason I can't make American Friends because I don't watch TV I'm on Netflix. It's true. Yeah, we have all these shared visions, these shared dreams. But when push comes to shove, we can talk about the shows we're watching or the right. sports we're watching. But if you're not into either of those things, yeah. you're just screwed almost. Yeah, if someone doesn't watch fighting, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I'm into. Um, I really like movies. Like right now is Oscar season, mm. so I've been watching a lot of movies. Mm. 
but they're not movies that a lot of people have seen. Like what? Know? What's a good movie? Um, <laughs> the one I just saw yesterday was Joy, about a woman who invents a mop. <laughs> oh yeah, what's, what's her what's her name? Sell. Um, Jennifer Lawrence is the actress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good movie. And then um, I saw The Hateful Eight this weekend. I heard that was beautiful. Yeah, it's you told amazing. me that was beautiful, actually. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, but I haven't seen uh, any of the Marvel movies. I haven't seen them recently. Yeah, I've me seen some of the past, but I didn't see Avengers. I didn't see, um, I don't know how many Captain Americas there are. Yeah. yeah, I'm the same. I haven't seen any of the, the recent superhero films. But I'm not above it either. Like, I've seen all the X-Men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of popcorn films. You mm -hmm. know, I'm. It's. I can't even remember the last time I thought a movie was bad. You know, mm. like there's always. I find I'm. I'm always for some reason. It, it's. It's not like purposefully. It's not like I'm gonna find something to enjoy. But somehow I just always find something to enjoy, even with the. You know, what a lot of people think are the worst films. Right. Like. Like th you're gonna think this is funny, but I watched you know the first three Star Wars, and mm. everybody like ragged on them. But there was so many elements of that, those stories that I really dug. You know, like right. there's, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to point out the bad acting or like, <laughs> yeah. or talk about They're you all know, flaws. Like, <laughs> yeah, all the flaws. But um, that's just not my personality to like harp on the flaws, and. Um, man, I'm I'm just so down for anything that works with that mythos mm. and works in that kind of that universe and the idea of the force and lightsabers and Jedi like I can't I can't not be excited about that so somehow I still found enjoyment out of those films and there are better versions online now like if you haven't seen any of the fan edits the fan oh, edits I are love phenomenal yeah. um, and they kind of like do all the polishing that you know George wasn't able to really pull together and um, but I, st I still liked him I think I felt kind of like I had this secret, you know, like I was a Jew in like Nazi Germany and I couldn't <laughs> tell anyone. Otherwise I would just be like <laughs> removed from the... <laughs> You're at a party and like, guys, I also didn't like those movies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just You're just like, oh, you know, just kind of yeah. finding that common ground. Yeah, Jar Jar Binks, he's, he really blows, you know. But he really upset my day. <laughs> yeah, but there was a lot of cool, you know, like everyone hates the first movie, but Qui-Gon Jinn is one That's of my awesome. favorite Jedis, man. He's yeah. like kind of lawbreaker, kind of does his own thing, mm -hmm. you know, defies the council. He's got a cool swagger to him. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a lot of a lot of good things to pull out of that. Some amazing lightsaber battles and Yeah. That's probably just good my personality. Racing. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> that. <laughs> Although That's the only part I haven't seen the movie in years, <laughs> but I remember that was one of my favorite things. Oh, you dug it? The pod racing part, yeah. I had like Maul, I really liked I had like an old N64 pod racing game, yeah. you know, that was really fun. I played like yeah. hours of that stuff. I used to play that as a kid too. Yeah. But you're saying uh, Wars of the Rainbow is very Dallas in the way that, um, you know, no one's really good, no one's really bad. And Star Wars is kind of like that, mm. where they, they polarize more so. Mm. But uh, they always talk about balancing the force. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not that light, the, the dark side's worse. Right. It's just that it's very young. You need the yin as well. Yeah. And so. I, I never quite understand when I read about how it's like perfectly balanced. Yeah. You know, like what do they say? Anakin had to kill all the Jedi because there's too many of them. Or, you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I don't yeah. really like know the, the universe that much. Right. To understand it. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I really like that part of it too. Yeah. I'm not sure if I, um, if I understand exactly what the, the overarching like grand ethos of of, of why the, you know, the Jedi and the Sith teeter so much, mm -hmm. like the light and the dark. But I do like the idea of, of the Jedi as being, you know, defenders, you know. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not so much about enforcing or proselytizing or creating a, a universe that's only light. Right. They're, they're about defending those who choose the light from the dark, you know. They're, they're not trying to eradicate, you know, the Sith so much. They're not on a war-torn tent to completely right. eliminate them. Um, that wouldn't be balanced. Yeah. Have that. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's kind of like um, what makes what makes Star Wars so profound is that is it puts a new lens on a lot of like deep archetypal like things that we deal with in our lives, you know, mm -hmm. like so much of what made the first film A New Hope I guess four in the series so rad is that if you were to just cut all of Obi-Wan's advice out of that film you've got like 10 you've got like 10 lines and two minutes of advice from the Jedi master himself and like 
every single one of those pieces of advice is is like trust your feeling. Mm. You know, a new yeah. hope from from a Jedi perspective is about returning to feeling, not not overthinking about you know turning off your kind of like mechanical um, objective mind and using something that's like a little bit harder to understand, a little yeah. bit less concrete, a little bit less structured, a little bit more. You know, well, a lot of people would say mystical, but I mean, we all got feelings, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the thing. It's like the mystic is the one who's in touch with his feelings, but it's, it's almost impossible not to be in touch with your feelings. Yeah. They just push you in that direction. Oh, the, how do you feel? You know, that's a really good question. And that's what I've been trying to do. This is the past couple months I've been in San Diego uh, trying to figure out which, uh, you know, my next step. And it's all kind of working out, like, for itself. Yeah, I was getting really down on myself the past couple of weeks because I set myself up with lots of projects, hmm. but um, I wasn't feeling them. I wasn't dedicating myself enough to them, and I got really depressed about it. I was like, man, I got like a third of a book written. <laughs> I'm just not doing it anymore. I get, even the third of it is written, like needs to be rewritten. Like, yeah. I have a lot of work to do on that. Huh. And then I started telling people I was writing it, and that's, that's never good. Yeah. Like I just did. I just told everyone listening. <laughs> 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 I've told you about it a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have like uh, stories written for a website that's not published. Yeah, you know, I have all these videos. I have videos on my tablet that no one's seen. Yeah, and uh, this whole time um, I've been training jujitsu though. That's the only like consistent thing. Uh -huh. Nothing that really makes sense to me. Yeah, you know, because when I got back here, I had like so many things I want to do. I want to do stand up comedy too, which I haven't found a way to, to balance all these things, and I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> no, balance is. Balance is totally possible. Um, With these many activities, though? Yeah, so so the thing is that, you know, all right, let's use Star Wars okay. and Obi-Wan's wisdom as, like, an, an archetype for understanding how, how somebody could become, like, a Jedi in their own life, you know, mm -hmm. be, like, a wielder of the fucking light. Well, you know I what I mean? Like, who doesn't want to be a Jedi? <laughs> like, who in their right mind ever watched those films and then, like, didn't, you know, like later in the day while, while hanging out on the shitter, taking a dump, try to get their toothbrush off the <laughs> counter. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like everybody did that shit. Everybody wants to be a, a Jedi and everybody wants to wield the force. And yeah, no one want to be Luke's foster parents. <laughs> Nobody wants to <laughs> come back all crispy, <laughs> you know? And um, <clears throat> All right. So, so that everybody has all of these desires, you know, mm -hmm. and I think we have like a, a big challenge that I've gone through in my life and I'll, I'll, I'll always continue to go through. This is like a type of work that's never done, mm. but it, it often happens where we get a million and one things that we think we want or that we think we want to do. And really those are just kind of more surface forms. Each one of them are important, but it's, it's not so much the form that we need to really like dig into and pay attention as much as the feeling that's like behind the form. When, when we can like take the time to look at our deeper feelings that are attached to that, like what is it about this that makes me want it? What is it about that that makes me want it? You know, you have very few people ever go through the process of, sorry. Oh, how rude. Faux pas. Faux thought pas. I turned this thing off. Good reminder to me though. Like it might happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, <clears throat> so like making it just like brutally personal about you because you brought it up. Right. So you got seven things that you want to do. Now, each one of those is a carrot on a, on a stick, mm -hmm. you know? So, but what, what's more important to ask in order to get clarity in your life is what is, what is it that that carrot symbolizes? And that's a tough question because it's an abstract question. Right. It's a question that only finds its truth in feeling. It can never find its truth in form. And so the process that the Jedi, you know, like the modern day Jedi, um, if we're taking old Ben's advice, needs to understand is that we're going to constantly have these series of things that we think we want and we think we need. And to ever find like real clarity, we need to do a little bit of internal distilling. You need to take, because you only have so many hours in the day, mm -hmm. and you also ha only have um, 
th there's also other aspects of, of how you get good at something that you have to consider. Like time is an important metric. Like the, the amount of interaction that you have doing one thing is gonna be directly correlated to how good you get at doing that thing. Right. So um, th it is important to consider and to have real clarity of choice when you know, we're going towards our goals. And you know, I almost even don't even like the term goal as much as, because it implies that you gotta go somewhere to get something. There's an end. There's an end and it's also, a goal orientation is a slippery slope for the very purpose that as long as you don't have your goal, you're not fulfilled. Right. Right? So that's just like a tricky, that's, that's kind of more what the Sith are all about, right? The Sith have a goal of like, you know, like galactic domination right. and they're just not fucking satisfied. They never <laughs> so, destroy enough. Yeah, planets. so everything they do is just some weird means to an end, you know, like I'll just kill these, this planet. I'm going to destroy this planet so that everybody will fear me. So then I can run the galaxy because running the galaxy is really something that I'm, I'm keen on. You know, I really want to get that goal accomplished. And um, you're always going to feel imbalanced when you don't have clarity on the things that you really want. Right. And so if you can find a way to, 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 to take a moment, and this is like you've already begun the process of going on meditation retreats, yeah. of, of, of beginning the process of like introspection. I don't even like the word meditation so much anymore, but deep introspection of like understanding where your like real passions, your like deepest desires and passions lie. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can kind of take that trip inward and really do the inside work to understand what it is you really love, then the more you can orientate yourself that way. So there might be things that you think are cool about some of these goals. Yeah. They might be really exciting, but you know, are these things that you can't get in other areas? Are there, are, are these things that can only be found there? Are these things that, you know, like so much of it is, you're never gonna work as hard, like we all know this, at anything unless you really deeply love it. Mm -hmm. You're never gonna deal with all the bullshit of like sucking at it. You're never gonna deal with all the like, you know, trauma of having a couple bad days and then getting back on the horse and making mistakes and getting back to it. and of the long waiting process of like from going to from beginner to mastery and whatever thing you want to master you're never going to really put up with any of that stuff unless you just love it right and the goal isn't even really a goal it's just an it's a powerful desire to be doing that thing you know it's like and you can't really reason that mm -hmm. that's that's why i love the a new hope because he's like hey man this is not about reasoning this is about feeling and very few very few people in life and you know ever take the time to really kind of consolidate all of their goals and understand what are the feelings where where are the passions what are the thing what what is it that really fuels them and so that they can like almost get rid of the stuff that isn't necessary like get rid of the chaff mm -hmm. so to speak um, and it's a tough process, man. Like, you know, I'm, I'm constantly in that process where I'll come up with great ideas for things that I think would be really cool to do or that I think I would love to do. And I find myself forcing, forcing myself to do them, chasing that carrot. And oftentimes it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same feeling as like showing up to the thing that I really love to do. And, you know, and having that kind of ruthlessness to be committed to the thing that you love and be clear about the thing that you love, to be clear how you want to be and act and, and work within that area, that's, that requires a, you just have to go through that process, man. You can't, you can't ever plan it out. You, you have to like know yourself, so to speak. Like knowledge, deep knowledge of self is a feeling thing. It's not mm -hmm. a thinking thing. Right. And that's what's so dope about the Jedi. You know? <laughs> They're always like, hey man, like, Trust your feelings, trust yourself, know yourself. You know, Luke, Luke always knew that he could thread the needle and make that shot and blow yeah, up the Death yeah, Star. Yeah. You know, he just knew. And 
and he could never explain that to anybody, you know? And so that process is like, okay, so, you know, you mentioned something like that, that process is like secretive. Mm -hmm. I've had a hard time. People, my, my biggest fear in these days is people <laughs> asking me why I do things. Yeah. Like I, I imagine in like a college reunion type setting, <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. like even like an impromptu one, yeah. which kind of happened. Like I hung out at the barbecue with some of my old classmates. Yeah, and, you know, I studied accounting at USD. Yeah, so all my friends were in accounting, and now they all work at big firms. Yeah, you know, they're all like flaunting their money and things. Oh God. And um, like, like for good reason. I'm sure there's like a lot of benefit to that, but it's just I'm doing the exact opposite. Yeah, I'm trying to scrape by, like working as little as possible. Work well. I also have a problem with that word work. Yeah. I don't, I'm not getting paid for anything these days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working really hard. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why jujitsu makes the most sense to me because when I wake up in the morning, uh, my first instinct is to get my body healthy. I stretch, I do yoga. Um, I've been doing something that you told me to do, which is uh, early in the morning before I eat food, uh, drink warm water. Yeah, that's the best. Hydrate like right away. Yeah. And I do all these things. You know, it's like so life. nice, isn't it? That little practice. Yeah. It's one of the coolest things. It's perking too. Like yeah. I feel it. Like I feel it in my body. Uh, sometimes I poop right after I do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? That's always like a bonus <laughs> or a benefit. Yeah, and then throughout the day, I just found that, you know, my diet's on point strictly because of jujitsu, though. Yeah. Like I look at food in terms of like, can I train well? If I eat this, yeah. If I have pizza for lunch, I'm not gonna train. Really, well. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I have cake at at, at uh, you know midnight, yeah, I'm not gonna sleep as well. Yeah, my body's gonna be more sore, so I will train less. <sighs> yeah, and it's not even because of like a specific tournament or anything. It's not because I want a belt. It's just because I know how bad I used to be, mm -hmm. and I never thought I'd be this good. Yeah. And I want to keep going. Right. I never thought I'd be able to strangle the guys I strangled. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, also, too, like, we fall in this trap, and this is, like, just what you were talking about, about going to, like, the high school reunion. Like, who on earth hasn't, who's graduated high school, <laughs> hasn't had a moment of anxiety about what the hell they're going to tell all their peers yeah, about, rough. you know? Yeah, I'll tell you who. It's, like, you only have that anxiety when you don't, know yourself mm. when you don't when you don't really know what it is that gets you going you know when you don't and that that thing whenever you whenever you do the work to kind of like do the introspection to find it there's no logic attached to it it's a feel it's a feeling and you that like feelings are inherently unreasonable and unlogical and you know it's not that logic doesn't have a place and, and we can come back to that later because it has a really important place to the man who understands his feelings very deeply, right. or the woman who understands their their self and like what really where their like passion lies, you know that like unfettered like untamed like wild raw passion. Um, but yeah, like trying to like all sorts of problems come up, you know, like, for example, like, you're, you're starting to find that you have this love for jujitsu. I'm willing to bet that you also have all this fear about what it would mean to commit to that love. What, yeah. you know, like, what would it mean? Like, what kind of, what kind of livelihood could I make? Like, how far could I really go? There's all these guys who are so much better and already yeah. have well-developed names and, you know, so strong. and then how am I going to justify this to my parents and my and, and all of these people? You know, you found that, OK, you wake up one day and, and you're discovering you have this love for this weird and quirky thing that that you ap appreciate tremendously deeply. And and no matter how much you try to rationalize it, you can't rationalize it. And no matter how much you want the whole world to fall in love with it, a lot of people just don't get it, yeah. you know, and it and it's a that. That's usually, like, that's kind of, like, one of the first, like, big obstacles is, <clears throat> is making sure that the passion and the love that you have is really unbridled and really true and really, really something that's fundamental. Because the second that you come to that realization that, like, okay, everything aside, if I don't do this, I'm not living my dreams. I'm not fulfilling my heart you know I'm not
doing the one weird thing that I feel like I really need to do in this world, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, your, your mind could attack it from an infinite amount of different ages, you know? Like, oh, what Hopefully. good is, you know, what good is this for the rest of the world? What about Elon Musk, you know? He's, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, there's just Not all. Not even saving <laughs> Yeah, right? Like, what about the, I could be the Buddha, or I could be this, or I could be that. And a lot of people are super afraid to tie into the, that fundamental deep kind of, desire that they have you know we read books about getting rid of desire not not working towards desire and man it's 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 no joke it's a scary place to be to start to find that you love something that other people don't maybe understand mm -hmm. maybe you don't understand and and it gets it gets even scarier when you don't even know what the future of that thing looks like um, I mean I Oh man, I've been there. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, if you had asked me, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, since you're poor as tea for strangers. Yeah, if somebody had told me in high school, you know, like <laughs> you're gonna be pouring tea for a living, and you know, tea's gonna be your your livelihood, I would have told them to go fuck themselves. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> you're, you're an idiot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know one of my favorite things, man, is. So, because I, I love fighting so much. I don't know why. I just love it. I've been wrestling for about 10 years now. I started when I was 14. I'm 24 now. Uh, I'm into it. I love watching MMA. I've been a fan of the UFC for 10 years, ever since I started wrestling. But lately, I've been trying to do lots of yoga around San Diego. And as well, these, like, um, you know, new age spiritual things. I went to, like, a storytelling session. It was very strange, but very fun. It turned into a drum circle. But my favorite thing is to tell these people all about fighting and just see their reaction because you know these are people who like spend their whole life like avoiding conflict uh, it's very important to them they're all about togetherness uh, for very good reasons and it's a very good thing and i do love being around them but it's so funny to look in their eyes and there's like you like fighting <sighs> like people are getting hurt <laughs> but yeah uh, he should improve his technique that's yeah it. it's, it's, and i remember my mom trying to ask me about it because I've been uh, studying Buddhism for four or five years now. Right. Pretty uh, consistently. Like you said, I go on meditation retreats. Um, I go hang out with the Zen circle every Monday. That's awesome. And my mom was trying to like rationalize. She's like, how can you like fighting and Buddhism? Yeah. And I had such like... Well, that's the secret a lot of people don't know is that it's... Especially jujitsu, it's one of the most intimate things you can do in the world, you know. And, and it's, it's full of compassion. Man. There's so much compassion and there's so much connection. There's it's it's a tremendously exciting and intense form of kinetic play. Mm -hmm. uh, you develop a tremendous amount of love for the people that you train with and respect for the human body. And you know, I think what people are mostly terrified of are things that they don't know. Yeah, you know, like it's scary if you don't know you know, people's intentions or why mm -hmm. people want to choke people. <laughs> yeah, as scared as um, me talking about fighting is yeah. like people at the drum circle. That is the exact same fear my dad has when he finds out I go to drum circles. <laughs> He's what? You do? Oh, my God. <laughs> or when I told him that I came here. Yeah. Because I've been coming here for a couple of years now, maybe yeah. six years, uh -huh. ever since I was a sophomore in college. I would come yeah. here and drink tea. Right. And for extended periods of time, like I would come here and sit for – three, four, five hours. Yeah. Just drinking tea and, and chatting. And he, he couldn't see the value in that. Oh, he blew his yeah. mind. Yeah. He had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's the hardest thing too is, and this is why like, for somebody who's bold enough um, to take the steps in the direction of, of love, you know, of doing the thing that they really love, um, a, a big protective measure, a big part of that is learning to internalize and kind of, privatize you know the depths of that love and not not have to justify it mm -hmm. because look if if you if you um, if you get preemptive or you get premature and you start toting before you have like a really deep understanding it somehow like loses all of its power you know like you're like hey I, I'm gonna write a book you know <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just gonna use you <laughs> if you don't mind because oh, you're pretty humble do, but like um, you know I've done it with other things where it's like okay I got this great plan now I go tell everyone about the plan and it totally destroys the plan yeah. it just dies because 
everybody gives me their opinion on how it should be, and that clouds my whole perspective, and everybody tells me the things that I can't do, or they tell me, oh, you should do this, and it has nothing to do with what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like I kill the idea before it's really come to fruition. The metaphor I like to use is like, you know, say you plant a seed, and it just like kind of sprouts a little bit. And you're like, oh, I can see it. You know, I can see the seed more clearly, okay? It's more dynamic than just something that's, you know, almost infinitesimal. You know, like people say like a mustard seed or something like that. You, you get this little idea and the idea sprouts a little bit. It develops a little bit. It's no longer just to write down your thoughts. It's to write down your thoughts in a book. And then you start to have a little bit of a name for the book and a little bit of an idea for the chapters. And that little seed like kind of pops. And if you go around telling people about it and, and you know, toting, toting your seed, it's almost like pulling the seed out of the ground to see where the roots are. You're like, hey, <laughs> yeah. let's see how far developed this thing is. Look at the roots. It's going to grow, you know. Guys, like, look at my book cover. <laughs> yeah, it's just like you kill the fucking thing. Yeah. And you can't pull, the, pull the, the plant up to see the roots. There's a, inherently in the, the, the development of that plant's life, there is a tremendous amount of activity that has to be secret. Right. You know, and the roots are the, they're kind of like the whys and the feelings and like, all the, like why would you write a book? All that, that's all the root shit. That's all this like deep, personal, subjective truth that you shouldn't have to justify to anybody. But, you know, they're going to be powerful to the degree that they're honed and sharpened and clear. And you know, like, oh, yeah, like, have to write about this one thing because I just like I have this infinite love for it mm -hmm. like I could literally write 10 books about this thing mm -hmm. you know but you shouldn't you got to you have to really be careful about showing that you know and trying to define that and just dumping that out there before the plan has really begun to develop you know right. there's a time when it's like some, you know, the, the, the baby's ready to be born. It's like bursting out, it, like you can't contain it. Like when my son was born, like the last week that, that my wife was walking around, everybody was like, she's about to pop, you know? And that, that's a very special feeling too. And so there's a, an element of patience and, and being somebody like yourself who's already started to understand their in, internal desires more than the average person, there's an element of patience and secrecy that are really important to enabling them to, to become more than just a cool idea that you shared with the world. Because cool ideas, everybody fucking has cool ideas, you yeah. know? The idea is worthless, honest, to be honest. The idea is, a, is, a, is something that the mind does to kind of give shape and give structure to this feeling. And uh, they're, they're valuable, but it's not the whole picture. There's, there's a whole other thing that needs to happen in order to, you know, realize our dreams and wield the force, you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like if, Just because you have an idea, you still need to go train with Yoda. Yeah, man, the Jedi doesn't somewhere. walk around the town going, hey, I know how to use a lightsaber. I'm, I got a lightsaber. I'm going yeah, yeah. to fight this guy, you know? Like, this is why I'm doing it. This is how <laughs> I'm doing it. You know, like nobody asked the Jedi, like, why are you a Jedi? They're uh -huh. just like, oh shit, that's a fucking Jedi. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, what that reminds me of <laughs> is um, back before I did jujitsu, I had this image of like a black belt in my head. Like a black belt is, you know, it's one of the highest levels in jujitsu. Not mm -hmm. the highest, but it's pretty high. Yeah. And so I thought that once you become a black belt, it's just like a solid level. And so a black belt match would just be two guys going like, Dude, I know what you're gonna do. Yeah. <laughs> just look at each other. <laughs> right. So there's nothing to do here. Yeah. <laughs> That's not That's the way so it is. Great. They, yeah. they, they, they collide. Yeah. They put it to the test. Yeah. You think you can defend an armbar? We'll put you in an armbar. Yeah. Which is why earlier I said that Jiu Jitsu is full of compassion. Yeah. Because when you're training something, especially in martial arts, yeah. it's easy to delude yourself. Yeah. I could sit here and with full confidence be like, there's nothing Taylor can do to me. Uh, just triangle choke them. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. I've done it to 50 other guys. It doesn't matter that yeah. the, the floor is made of wood. It doesn't uh, matter this is his shop. It doesn't uh, matter that his friends are around. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I could strangle this guy. Yeah. And jujitsu, the compassion comes in where you can say, you think you can choke me? Let's find out. Yeah. You know, there's no talking necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like if you're there, like the dumbest situation I can imagine is two guys at a gym saying, I could beat your ass. Yeah. And then not doing it. 
not doing it. Yeah. Not, not trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what the compassion is. It, it destroys delusions. Yeah. Which is a big thing that got me into Buddhism is, is talking about like the, the worst way to live life is when your mind, when your desires and when the things you want are not here and they're not going to be here. Yeah. You know, like, um, for, for example, every time I see one of my friends I haven't seen in a while, because you know, I spent two years in Asia, I, I largely didn't talk to my friends, I yeah. didn't see any of them, they didn't come to visit me. Right. And so last time they saw me, well, I was in college, and I had a girlfriend at the time, and she's a great girl, I got nothing bad to say about her, she's awesome, we just went our separate ways. Right, this happens. And that happens. But when I see my friends, they always ask me about her. Yeah. Like, oh, do you still see her? Do you talk to her? Uh, I'm like, oh, no, not at all. Yeah. And like, why, dude? She was awesome. Yeah. And I agree. Like, she's amazing. She's a great girl. Yeah. I'm sure whatever she's doing is great. Yeah. But it would be the epitome. I would fall straight into depression if I deluded myself into thinking I'd get her back. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I've looked down that path before. Yeah. I've tried to delude myself and be like, well, you know, maybe if I work out and get a job, like, <laughs> 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 maybe if, you know, I'm sure a boyfriend's not that cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, like, that ship's sailed. Like, it's been too long. It's, at least from where I am now. Maybe things will change, but I doubt it. And Yeah. So, well, and that also ties into what, what we were talking about earlier, which is, that's, a, that's an idea. Mm -hmm. But what's behind the idea is, like, a feeling. And maybe there's feelings that she symbolizes that are really important to you. The feeling of very large boobs. <laughs> That's <laughs> totally possible, <laughs> right? But she's not the only one with really large boobs. And sure. there's also all of those feelings, you know, are in, they're coming from you anyway. Right. So, the, so instead of looking for the outer form, if you can trust the inner feeling, like what fucking Obi-Wan says, is that you can have all of your desires birthing from you instead of you chasing them. Like, not, not like you're going for your desires, but you're living your desires. Yeah. And that's like a super subtle point, and it requires a tremendous amount of, of internal subjective wisdom. You know, it, 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 tr it requires somebody who's totally committed to knowing themselves and knowing what they really want and understanding their feelings really deeply. And very few people are, are you know, p participating in that, that activity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, like I, I want more and more people to, you know, imagine a world where everybody really knows themselves truthfully and really, you know, why the question of like, of like, hey, what do you do? Isn't a question that's part of our society. That's the worst question. I, I hate that question. Yeah, me too. What's your job? What do you do? That's a question of function. It's like it implies that human beings are robots and that our value is something like determinative of our capacity to do a specific job. The real question should be like, what? What gets you, like, what are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. What do you live for? You know, what is it in your life that just, that, like, gets, gets all your juices flowing and makes you feel like you're totally alive? That should be the question. Because that's what matters the most. That's what, that's what a meaningful life is, is, like, somebody who's doing the thing that they love to do, that's, like, intrinsically the most valuable and meaningful and purposeful and all that jazz. And, um... You know, there's only one way to find that, and that's to, like, turn your attention inward and seek supreme clarity, yeah. you know? And we have a, a culture of people who have a broadband problem, bandwidth problem. You know, there's too much information coming, right. and it's not filtered. And so if you're, if you're lost in that information, you're going to be c constantly getting all these different reactions and subjective feelings as you scroll through your Facebook or you watch the news or watch television or talk to 50 other people. But if you turn your attention inward, there's just as much dynamic activity, but it ha it's, it's from you. Mm -hmm. It's from your you know, soul, meaning like it's distinct. It's, it's only, only you can see it, only you can feel it. Yeah. And that's where like all the fucking gold is, man. And if you're, if, if you're kind of, instead of being a slave to all the outside feelings, and all the, all the things that those symbolize, if you can you know, be ruthlessly committed to your internal feelings, you'll find an infinite amount of power, an infinite amount of patience, an infin infinite amount of love. You're gonna be the guy who shows up to every event, into every room, into like, every place, satisfied with his life, mm. satisfied with where he is. When people ask you, 
why you're doing what you do, you could just say, because I followed my heart, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> what's the alternative to living your dreams, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, there's, the why is just so, it's not even a question of why, it's like, what, what fuels you is a more important question than why are you fueled? That's like right. a dumb fucking question, you know? And it pisses me off continually. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I like what you say about uh, people are looking uh, externally to stuff when uh, internal. There's a lot going on there, man. Yeah. Like, so I do these week-long retreats. I've done a couple of them. Yeah. I did one of Vipassana yeah. in Hong Kong, and then I did the Zen retreat in San Diego. I'm going to Vipassana again yeah. in San Fran in March. Good. And every yeah. time I describe these to people, it's just 10 days of meditating. You meditate yeah. eight to nine hours a day. Yeah. And people think, like, what, you're not on your phone? Like, no, not my phone. <laughs> do we have Netflix? No, no Netflix. Yeah. You're not doing anything? Like, no, yeah. you can't read. Uh, you can read. Like, no, they told you not yeah. to. And then they, they, the word that comes up all, every time is boring. Yeah. Like, what? That must be so boring. You're just boring. sitting by yourself. Yeah. But it's not at all, man. Like, there's not a, there's not a dull moment. Right. And it's really I hard know very for well, people yeah. to understand. It was hard for me to understand. I yeah. didn't know that going into it. Yeah. But, like, once you start looking inward, once you, um, you know, kind of the, the trick of these things is they tell you to, to turn off your mind. Yeah. And the reason you do this is to realize that there's no fucking way to turn it off. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. It's going. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it is. And you wouldn't want to turn off your mind. Yeah. Because, you know, and it ultimately, thought is a super awesome, powerful thing that allows us to do tremendous things in the world. We don't want to get rid of thought by any means. And the kind of the whole point is to, um, you know, s maybe slow it down or direct it in a certain way. Mm. But even then, man, in the beginning stages of meditating, um, they refer to it as the monkey mind. Your mind's just jumping around. Every time you think of one thing, it leads in three different directions. Yeah, or you know, five like, or ten. <laughs> yeah, like, man, I used to live in San Diego. San Diego's cool. Taylor lives there. Taylor was cool. Tea is good. Tea is wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like it goes through. Uh -huh. And that's sometimes fun to watch, man. Yeah. Just see where the brain's going. Yeah, you know, like a personal thing that I, I, I get really down on is at the end of the day, I sit in a, in a room totally quiet. And, you know, so what you have is you have your phone. This, I see this all the time, right? And I'm, I'm subject to this, too. I do this at least once a day where I get online and I go to Facebook or I go to the, a news thing that I like or I go to, a, you know, I like MMA too, so I'll go to an MMA website. And you find yourself kind of scrolling. Yeah. And what I like to relate that to is it's kind of like, a, you, you ever seen a kaleidoscope? Mm -hmm. You know, right? Like you're, you sit there and you kind of make these little adjustments and you're looking for something that's particularly beautiful or particularly interesting or novel. You know, like the turning is, is you're trying to, to play with it to get this really great dynamic image that, that somehow just makes you feel like, ah, oh, that's, that's great, that's beautiful. And that's, that's fucking what everybody's doing, man. You know, we have these little phones. These are our little personal kaleidoscopes. And we're just scrolling, we're turning the image, looking for that, that weird assortment of image and light that makes us feel nice. Like, oh, that's cool, you know? Yeah. See what your friends are doing. Yeah, that's cool. Get updated, get some gossip. Yeah, as yeah. though cool and nice and feel and excitement, as though those feelings come from outside of us. Mm. But there's a whole nother kind of like uh, news feed. There's a whole nother kind of like lens or spectrum that you can tune into, and that's the internal one. And if you, if you shut everything off and you create like a little space where it's just you and it's dark, and there's not a lot of distraction. Maybe you close your eyes a little bit and you sit comfortably or you lie down and you turn your attention inward. The, it, the same thing is happening. Your mind is scrolling and it's, it's as dynamic and wild as a news feed or, you know, like it's, it's, it's the same amount of stuff. It's just not as, it lacks a certain clarity. It has a different quality. And so understanding, you know, turning your attention inward, you, you have a, you start to participate in something that's really unique, which is the search for, a lot of people are searching for what to do or where to go or what to like or what other people are liking. Yeah. But when you turn your attention inwards to that inward news feed, you you're, you're, you're begin the process of finding who you really are. And you can begin to, just like the kaleidoscope on the outside, you can begin to, through, through like a subtle process of patience and 
close observation and changing this thought and that thought, you can start to move that aperture and develop clarity, like deep internal clarity. And it's, it's a totally subjective process. Like nobody can see it happening but you. It's, the, it's your own thing for you to do by yourself. And nobody can tell you if what you're doing is right or wrong or any of that bullshit. And what you really should be tuning the aperture for is like your deepest, most powerful, most profound loves and passions. Because that's where the, all the energy of life comes from. You know, the things that you want to express about life, the things that you want to, you know, experience about life from your heart, you know, from like from from the well inside so that instead of looking outside for that shit, you can just be touting, that. you know, like you can you can be your own light in the darkness yeah. instead of going to warm yourself against someone else's light, you know, light of Facebook. The warm light of Facebook or the, or the warm light of an awesome performer or the warm light of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, or, a, or a nice job or a big bank account or all the other shit that you feel like you need to warm yourself. But you, this is why Wim Hof is fucking the coolest dude ever because he's like, no, man. He's like, you don't need fire to be warm. All you need is your mind. You know? Your you, breath. Yeah, your breath, which is yourself and your mind. And, you know, he's found a way, this tremendous way, to develop all of his own internal heat, man. The guy's a fucking, he's a human fireplace. Mm -hmm. He never needs to light a fire. He found, like, everything he needs is inside of him to survive the cold, to survive the world, to, to do all this other stuff. That's what's so inspiring about Wim. It's not that he can do these heroic feats. It's that he's tapped into his own infinite power, you know? And that his power is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you think if Wim, like, told everybody that, you know, like, this is why I do that, blah, 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 all this other shit, before he had really developed it, people, everybody would have shot him down. Yeah, maybe some people listening don't know about Wim Hof. Can you say what he developed? Yeah, well, Wim, the Wim Hof method is, is like, bursting onto the scene right now. But Very really, popular. But really what, what, what he did is he's, he's modernized the, the sweet science of breath. Mm -hmm. And so Wim is now training professional athletes and you know, CEOs and, and people from all across the world to harness their breath to do phenomenal things, to control their autonomic nervous system, you know, the part of their nervous system that was previously thought all the way until they did these crazy scientific tests on Wim and his students uh, to be totally atomic, mm -hmm. not controlled by self. And he's, through his breath, has been able to control the part of the self that we thought we couldn't control. Right. And so he's famous and he's awesome and he's a beautiful man, you know? Mm -hmm. But his thing, his passion is so weird, you know? But look at how he inspires people. It doesn't matter what the thing is. What matters is that you find the thing. Yeah, he's inspired me, man. Did I tell you the, the workout I do because of him? Uh -uh. I've only done this a couple times um, and it's always like a result of... Um, some intense uh, self-hatred mixed with a little bit of marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> That's a potent combination. <laughs> and so what I do, because he advocates being in the cold. And we live in San Diego. There's not much cold around here. It gets a little chilly if you're wearing sandals but not shoes. <laughs> 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 what we're dealing with is not too, too much. But what we do have is a cold ocean. Yeah. And I live very conveniently to the ocean. I live about a mile away yeah. in PD. And so what I do is I put on my bathing suit and a jacket and my running shoes and I run uh, as fast as I can down to the water. You know, there's stoplights and I'm not too, such a good runner. So as fast as I can is not like, impressively fast or anything. But then when I get to the water, I do his breathing method on the boardwalk, which is just, um, you know, how would you describe it? A big inhale and then a partial exhale. Big inhale partial exhale so there's always oxygen in your yeah lungs. you there's a, a bunch of YouTube videos yeah. just type type in Wim Hof method people will see it Joe Rogan does a good breakdown one. I made one. <laughs> oh yeah Have you seen what I, did? I did I saw it okay. yeah it's good and then uh, so what I do is I do that across the boardwalk and then I get in the sand take off my jacket take off my shoes and sprint into the water mm -hmm. and the reason I do this is because I hate the feeling of cold water who doesn't? It sucks. Yeah. It's terrible. Steals your breath. Makes Steals your nuts your shrink into your body. <laughs> yeah. Makes your dick shrivel yeah. up. <laughs> and so that's the hardest part is just getting to the waist. Yeah. Right? Like feet are kind of bad, but your knees. And then once you get to the balls, that's where it's like, 
that's where it takes. Uh, that's when it starts to steal your breath, and then yeah. the chest is even worse. And good God, hard. the head, the head's a head's a bad one too. Yeah, and so I've done this a couple times, right, over the past uh, month, huh. and I'm still, <laughs> I'm still like such a bitch about it because yeah. I run into the water. Uh, get my balls wet, which is really an accomplishment for me. <laughs> and then you're supposed to just dive, right? At yeah. that point, why not? Yeah. But <laughs> every time, I dunk my head and then run out. <laughs> oh, man. So it's like just my upper back Yeah, so you leave dry. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But why? Like, it's already... Yeah. It can't get much worse. I did uh, the two hardest parts, balls and head. Balls and head. Like, yeah. my, my hair is wet. <laughs> 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 but my upper back is dry. Yeah, well... You know, I have a lot of experience with, um, you know, prana, pranayama, with yogic breathing, with Wim Hof breathing. My, you know, is pranayama similar to Wim Hof? There are there are elements that are like if you do a, if you you could do a Venn diagram. Uh -huh. You know, there's a lot that intersect and okay. they both compare, and then there's aspects that are distinct to each. Okay. But um, I actually, uh, you know, I've I've I learned the Wim Hof method years before. I even knew it was Wim Hof doing it from right. another one of his students. So I had actually begun the practice of, of that type of breathing and many other types of, of, of breath work, um, you know, for almost half a decade. And um, it's, it's one of the greatest things that I've ever started to pick up and started to play with. You know, it's a, it's a powerful tool for um, getting to a comfortable place to explore the subjective realms, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, as we said through the whole conversation, it's absolutely like necessary. If you don't know yourself, what the hell kind of life are you gonna have? Mm -hmm. If you haven't touched all those deep parts of yourself and you know found tremendous clarity, you're just never gonna. I don't know. You'll just always blame everybody else, and you'll just yeah, always yeah. feel lost. You you will always feel lost. So it's great for getting to the subjective. It's great for health. It's great for energy. Um, but what's really cool about um, the Wim Hof breathing is that when it's done properly, you actually uh, get to a place where you enjoy the cold. Hmm. Like you, you actually really deeply enjoy the cold. Does this happen to you? Yeah, definitely. Where it's, the cold is inviting. Hmm. Where it's like, you, you want to participate in the cold. You know, uh, the Vice documentary that's on Wim Hof starts with a, with a, with a great statement, which is, the cold is a noble force. You, you start to crave the cold shower. You start to crave the, I was visiting my parents in Borrego the, recently and they have a hot tub. And my dad and I get in the hot tub and they had a pool right next to it. Yeah. You know, and it's been freezing recently. Yeah. So the pool was like 40 degrees. And I was sitting in the hot tub, I gotta I got get into the pool. <laughs> my dad thought I was crazy, you know? But when you get into it, and you kind of surrender to your breath and the intelligence of, of whatever breath practice you you've kind of worked on, there's something really peaceful and tremendous and powerful about the cold that you kind of, I don't know, you, you want to engage with more and more and more. So I, I think a, a really important thing for you to do would be to, or anybody to do who really wants to understand Wim is just pay the 200 bucks, you know, and take his course. Or, um, you know, he does like a three video thing. Um, you can sign up and he teaches you how to do the cold showers. Have Pract you done this? Yeah, the cold showers are awesome. Okay. I, I really enjoy cold showers. Um, yeah, cold he does like a 30 day cold shower. Cold. Yeah. Okay. And um, a really good transition, a good way to, to begin to develop the practice is to go straight into a cold shower after jujitsu. Mm. So this is an opportunity you have daily. Yeah, and it, one that I always look at uh, but I always do like it's just something I've done my whole life. Where as soon as like, like if the shower is cold, I stand off to the side and like use my hand to see if it's getting warm yet. Even at the gym, where it doesn't get that warm and I know it, I wait for it to reach its peak. Yeah. And every time I'm like, I know that there's health benefits. If I get in that cold water, I will feel better yeah. later. Right. But it's that first blast. Uh, yeah, that, that's it's a hard been, it's been on my list of like. Once I improve, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think of it the other way. Like, once I'm better, I'll be able to do that instead of, um, how would you say, like, do that to improve. Yeah. I like, well, guess the goal instead of, like, the method. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And, and also part of it, too, will probably be learning. This is the thing, too. Like, motivation helps. So, mm -hmm. like, for example, the thing that really got me into the cold work was watching Choke Oof. and watching that scene with Hickson. 
where like his brother and his son and every you know they go to Japan they go if you have you know for your listeners if they haven't seen choke it's my favorite documentary yeah it's free on YouTube it's an yeah. hour and a half of um, uh, follow just Hicks a master Gracie. it doesn't yeah. matter that he's jujitsu it's like yeah. you have a life mass um, like a, a man who has mastered himself through yes. his practice and his art and part of his practice is getting into, you know, high alpine freezing rivers. Mm -hmm. There's snow on the banks. Yeah. And his brothers who are all savages. They're all like, if they weren't. Multiple time world champions. Yeah. They could choke. Uh, you know, if you, savages. if you give them a thousand people to choke, they're going to choke all 1,000 of them all in of one them day. Not named, <laughs> um, not named Sakuraba or Eddie Bravo. Right, with, yeah, with a small <laughs> exception, with a real small exception. I mean, just just awesome masters. Yeah, you know? and you see those guys, the reason I brought it up is because Hickson's there, he's under the waterfall, he's like, <sighs> doing his crazy breathing, and you see Hoyler Gracie, one of the most bad dudes on the planet. Yeah. He dips his toe in and runs. Yeah, he can't handle <laughs> it. And, and the yeah. thing about Hickson is he's just at peace. And he says a few things in that that are so poignant, you know, that just grabbed, grabbed me personally, which was like, you know, he says, I'm a water person. I can understand my fear and understand my emotions and understand myself in the face of this challenge, which is cold water. I don't know if he says that, but that's, and, that's and what he's is, implying. And this is a guy who didn't grow up near cold water. It's not like a childhood thing for him. Yeah. Whereas, you know, Wim Hof, yeah, he's from Northern Europe. Right. It's a cold place. Yeah. Hickson's not. He's from Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. It's a hot place. He's a surfer. Yeah. A warm ocean. Yeah. But it's still, when he's in Japan, he goes straight for the cold water. Yeah. He understands it. He sees the benefit. Yeah. And engaging the cold is, you know, you inherently, there's, what it, what's noble about the cold is it's not going to give you anything, mm. you know? Like, everything gets focused into the deep subjective you have one choice and that's control yourself control your breath generate your own heat find your own internal relationship with the cold so nothing is going to focus your attention deeply and subjectively like the cold i mean it's it's the magnified it's the fucking hubble telescope for subjective insight for understanding your fears and your emotions and all of those things and, and there's a reason why hickson you know, was super into that practice. There's a reason why Hoff, you know, is super into that practice. And there's a reason why a lot of the, you know, really high level yogis that I know are into that type of practice. Mm. And it's beautiful, you know. So I think if you can understand, you know, the fact that it's, it is a powerful tool for self-knowledge, then you can play with it with a little bit more earnestness, you know, because that, that, that tool in and of itself will improve whatever your life's pursuit is. Understanding yourself better, understanding your fears better, understanding you know, um, how to relate to really challenging situations, which like the cold is one of the most challenging situations. That helps every, every aspect of your life, and that's what's cool about it. But if you never did it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be at a loss. It's just one of the thousands of ways to come to know yourself a little bit more. I mean, so much of jujitsu is you get into this impossible situation where for five minutes, there is no, no help. Right. There is no, no one to rely on, especially when you're rolling with someone who's talented and who is like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, callous, <laughs> you know, like who, who's really powerful and also just doesn't have the same, you know, I, I have like softer skin and like more sensitive <laughs> nervous systems. And I, you know, sometimes I'm rolling with these guys and I feel like they're just solid rock, they're mm -hmm. sandpaper. And they just like, they're, they're not really worrying about how their, you know, movements are making me feel, you know? Right, so it's right. not just that I'm, you know, being dominated. It's just the whole thing is very uncomfortable. And a lot of these guys tend to, you know, what, not shower as much, yeah. you know, like it can yeah. get pretty rough. And the cool thing about it is, like, sometimes you know this before the match starts. Yeah. You, know, you see a guy, you know, neither of us are very big guys. Yeah. Some of our uh, teammates are. Yeah. So you see a guy, maybe he's 200 pounds. Yeah. And Jiu-Jitsu is a belt system. So you see a guy, his belt is higher, which just means he's been doing it longer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your coach thinks he has a higher knowledge. Yeah. He's reached a level 
So if I see like a two hundred pound purple belt, yeah, there's not a fucking thing I can do. To this there's guy. nothing you can no, do. I'm not gonna win. Yeah. <laughs> and if that two hundred pound purple belt just doesn't really know you, and he's not gonna hurt you, but it's not gonna be comfortable. It's just yeah. not. And and that's the thing is that those those five minutes are so beautiful because it's just you. Mm-hmm. You're left to just you, and he's not gonna he's not gonna do anything you want him to do. Only, the only thing that you have control of in that moment is you. Yeah. And that's that deep self-knowledge is, is you can get that in a thousand and one different places. So if you never, you know, maybe the cold seems cool to you, but it doesn't have to be your practice. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's, I think that's a big, that's a, a big challenge that we have right now in terms of the bandwidth issue that I was talking about is that there's a lot of ways that work. And so we're like, oh, I need to do this because this guy does this, and I need right. to do that because that guy does this. And then I heard him. this works. And this, but maybe you just don't feel the, you know, maybe you just don't feel depressed if you're not getting in the cold like Wim Hof does. Oh shit, like I haven't been in ne- negative thirty water for right, months, right. you know. So like, maybe it's just not your practice. Yeah, like I have a friend who's done one jujitsu class in his life. So n- at no point in his life is he thinking like. Oh, Today sucks because I haven't done jujitsu. Yeah, but for me, I, I've been going almost every day, right? Yeah. So the days that I don't go, I stand in my house and I'm just think like, what else is there? Yeah. So that's an issue that I have that my buddy does not. And that's <laughs> it will never cross his mind. He should be doing it. Right, and that's fine for him. You know, a yeah, beautiful, he's, he's powerful kind of tool is depression. Mm-hmm. Man, depression is my favorite emotion. Because if I ever if I ever start to get depressed that I'm not doing something, that's a rare thing. And that deep depression shows me the degree of sub- deep internal subjective love that I have. It's like more than anger or frustration that I'm not doing it. It's like heart wrenching depression. Like oh, I wish I could be doing this. Like why am I not doing this? Or why is this not? Ha-? That's a lot of people fear that. A lot of people don't want that. But I, I really value it, you know? Like, th- that is one of the strongest tools that has helped me pour my heart into my vocation, you know, into, into my life's work, which is kind of weird and hard to describe to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But if I'm, if I'm ever not engaged in it deeply and, like, intimately, I start to get depressed. And that's, that's a good thing because I'm not depressed that I'm not playing, like, water polo <laughs> right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I might, you know, you know... But, but say I meet somebody who's really energetic, who's really, you know, um, like a beautiful man. Morning, guys. guys. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good podcast right now. Yeah, yeah come maybe on. we can wrap it up pretty soon. Yeah. All right. Taylor's just on a good Hey, one. long time no see. How are you? Really good. Yeah. 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 Very good. Yeah, Hi, Monica. I'm Taylor. <laughs> nice to meet you. You guys want to finish up and stuff out? Um, yeah, we'll just wrap it up right now. Yeah. You're on a good note. That's cool. Yeah. But as soon as you said, like, depression's, like, so helpful, because I spent my whole life avoiding depression. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's been the goal of most of my things. Yeah. But the way you said it is very beautiful. I can use that to my benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been talking for an hour. Cool. Let's wrap it up. Sweet. Um, how can we plug you? MadMonkTea.com. Best fucking tea in the world. <laughs> Don't believe it. Come here to the shop. You can drink for free. It's a donation box. If you're feeling inclined, if you think it's bullshit, spit in this man's face and leave. <laughs> so you can take it. <laughs> but you might get choked. <laughs> might get choked. Might get choked. It's okay. Um, anything else, man? Anything else you have going on? Nah, man. This was really fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, yeah. dude. Tales from the Cock Podcast. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.